Islam in Malaysia finds its roots in a proselytization or dakwa efforts of traders and missionaries from Arabia, Persia and India in the 13th century. Islam then spread among traditional Malay society and penetrated the legal system by the 15th century due to Malay rulers embracing Islam and establishing a legal system which incorporated Islamic law and Malay customary law. This can be seen in various legal digests dating from the 15th to the 19th century, such as Hukum Kanum Melaka, the 99 Laws of Pera, the Pahang Digest, the Kedah Digest, and the Johor Digest. The development and prominence of Islam in the legal system was only curtailed due to British colonization in Malaya. According to R.J. Wilkinson, if not for British law stepping in, there is no doubt that Muslim law would have ended up becoming the law of Malaya. Nevertheless, despite the obstacles, in the years leading up to independence and in the making of the 1957 federal constitution, Islam remained prominent and is still regarded of having special status even to this day. Coming to the special constitutional status of Islam, there are six main articles to be discussed. The first is Article 3, Clause 1, which provides that Islam is a religion of the Federation. In interpreting this article, the first case to discuss is the landmark decision of Che Omar against public prosecutor, whereby the Supreme Court held that the provision, Article 3, Clause 1, merely provided for a ritualistic and ceremonial role of Islam. In coming to this conclusion, the court analyzed how Islamic law during the British colonial period was limited to personal matters and determined that it was within this context that the constitutional framers intended the meaning of Islam in Article 3, Clause 1. Nevertheless, the, in the following case, Lena Joy, the court held a different view and stated that Article 3, Clause 1 actually has a wider meaning than just a mere fixation of the official religion. In fact, Faiza Tambi Chikche, the learned judge, stated that by looking at the constitution as a whole, it is the general tenor of the constitution that Islam is given a special position and status, with Article 3 declaring Islam to be the religion of the federation. It is clear that the effect of Article 3 Clause 1 grants Islam a special position in the constitution, to the point where in fact some authors put forward that Article 3 confers a positive obligation on the government to preserve, promote and propagate Islam in ensuring its superiority as the religion of the federation. Next is Article 11 Clause 4 which empowers the legislature to enact laws prohibiting the proselytization of Muslims. Being that Malaysia is a multicultural, multiracial country, it is inevitable that there is a wide diversity of different religions in Malaysia. Article 11, Clause 1 therefore stipulates the fundamental right to freely profess and practice all such religions. Nevertheless, this freedom is still subject to the special status of Islam pursuant to Article 11, Clause 4, whereby the propagation of any religious doctrines among Muslims may be restricted or controlled by state and federal law. The federal constitution, by virtue of this article, thereby provides an implicit prohibition of apostasy among Muslims. Now, apostasy or ridda is a very sensitive issue evidenced by the controversy surrounding the Lina Joy case. Due to the sensitivity, it is clear that Article 11.4 serves as a safeguard by preventing any undue encroachment on the rights of Muslims and balancing the liberties of the minority communities and the special status of Islam. Next, Article 12 Clause 2 provides that the federal and state government has the liberty, power and privilege to establish, maintain or assist in establishing or maintaining Islamic institutions or to provide or assist in providing instructions in the religion of Islam and they may incur necessary expenditure for this purpose. Therefore, pursuant to this article, the government is authorized to spend money on the administration of Islamic law through annual supply acts and enactments. According to Article 74, Clause 2 of the Constitution, the state legislature may pass laws pertaining to any of the items in a state list, which includes Islamic law, such as family law and personal matters, so long as a person professes the religion of Islam. In the federal territories, similar laws governing Islamic matters are passed by parliament. As Malaysia is not a theocratic state, Islamic laws are only applicable to Muslims. However, this does not mean that Malaysia is a secular state. In fact, by virtue of Article 74 Clause 2, there exists an Islamic legal system allowing Muslims in Malaysia to practice Islam not only in private, but also in public with the government's assistance in facilitating the practical implementation of Islam. It is clear that Article 74 Clause 2 does provide a great deal of autonomy to the states when it comes to matters pertaining to Islamic law. However, it is not, um, it is not 
Overall, because according to Article 75, if a state law does contradict with a federal law, the federal law shall take precedence and the state legislation shall be not invoked to the degree of the inconsistency. As Malaysia practices a dual legal system, there is an establishment of civil courts and sharia courts to reflect this. The constitution then allows the establishment of the three levels of sharia courts, i.e. the sharia subordinate courts, sharia high court and the sharia appeal court, recognized as specialized courts pursuant to Article 121 Clause 1A of the federal constitution. This article precludes the civil court's authority over any case that falls under the purview and jurisdiction of the Sharia courts and is significantly responsible for the recognition of the Sharia courts as it stands today. This clause was only included after a 1988 amendment, but its effect is significant as it catapulted the Islamic religious courts to an equal constitutional status with the civil courts. This means that now, the Sharia court system is a separate hierarchy from the civil courts and there is no power of judicial review or appeal by the federal high court over the state Sharia court. The last point regarding the special constitutional status of Islam can be seen in how the constitution actually makes it a duty upon the heads of state in Malaysia to be the head of Islam. This is pursuant to Article 3, Clause 3 and 3, Clause 5 of the constitution which makes the Yang Dipetuan Agong the head of Islam in his own state, the federal territories and the states of Malacca, Penang, Sabah and Sarawak. Whereas according to Article 3, Clause 2, each sultan of the state is the head of religion of Islam in their respective states. It is actually um, de defying the rule of the states or the YDPA in their capacity as the head of Islam is actually illegal. Furthermore, no other religion in Malaysia has an equivalent constitutional provision establishing an official head of religion. It is clear that by explicitly incurring the right and duties upon the heads of state to be the head of Islam at a federal level and a state level is a recognition that Islam is of special status and must be protected. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Alia and I will be continuing the discussion on the significance of the special constitution status of Islam. Moving on to the next slide. Now, the establishment of Islam as the official religion at federal and state levels has actually implication for the general people and in fact the significance is said to be quite a number and it is undoubtedly true that islam actually has a special um, status in the constitution and it was established in the introduction that islamic law was actually ingrained in the malay customs during the 14th century it was the law of the land up until the reception of english law during the british intervention and during that period hukum kena melaka and the undang undang law melaka included the rules of islamic law in personal matters, terminal, as well as commercial law. And because of the influence of Islam, the other Malay state decided to join and incorporate their own number of digests, consisting the principles of Islamic law, and it has been embodied in both Pahang and Johor's digest. However, after the British intervention in 1786, the British introduced a number of receptions of English law in the Federated States, unfederated state as well as Sabah and Sarawak. And the aim is actually to implement um, the English common law in the Malay state and to take over the administration system. So the indigenous law was only used in respect to personal affairs like marriage, inheritance after English law was introduced to the Malay states. And as a result, the Islamic law was eventually disregarded by the judicial system. So we can infer that without British intervention, the Islamic law would have been the law of the land of the Malays. Now, when the constitution for the Federation of Malaya was being drafted by the Red Commission, the question as to whether there should be any statement in the constitution that expressed that Islam should be the state religion that's considered. And it can be summarized from the commission's report that the aliens party submitted a memorandum for a provision stating that the religion of Malaysia shall be Islam and the observance of this principle shall not impose any disability on the non-Muslims nationals professing and practicing their own religion and shall not imply that the state is not a secular state be inserted in the constitution. However, this was not agreeable by the commissioners as they felt that such a provision would contradict the secular nature of the state. And further, the councils for the Malay rulers submitted that their highnesses was not in favour of the inclusion of such a provision as such a provision in the constitution would actually encroach on their traditional position as the head of Islam in their own respective states. 
In spite of that, the Pakistani member of the commission, Mr. Abdul Hamid, felt that the recommendation of the Alliance Party was harmless and suggested that a provision providing that Islam shall be the religion of the state of Naya, but nothing in this article shall prevent any citizen professing any religion under the Islam to profess and practice and propagate that religion, nor shall any citizen be under any disability by reason of his not being a Muslim be inserted. He further indicated that there were around 15 countries in the world that have a provision like that, but there was no evidence that a declaration of a religion has caused hardship to citizens of the respective countries. He also concluded that no harm would ensue that it was included in the constitution of Malaya. And the Alliance Party also explained that the intention of the provision was not to intrude the position of the rulers as the head of Islam in their respective states, but rather to make Islam the official religion of the federation for ceremonial purposes. And the rulers accepted the explanation and thus Article 3 of the Federal Constitution declares Islam as the religion of the federation. Thus, it can be observed that there already existed an established legal system in the Malay states before the British intervened and introduced English law. And to highlight here, the lex loci before the intervention by the British was none other than um, the Islamic law. And it was actually fused together with the customary practices of the Malays at that time. And in relation to, cutter, to the current times, it would be appropriate to say that the significance of the special constitutional status of Islam is actually due to its imposition by the Malay rulers who administered Islamic law in the legal system dating all the way back to the 14th century and thus should be highlighted in the religion of the federation. In addition, since being a Malay means being a Muslim, it can be inferred that the identification of a Malay with religion that is Islam, is significant in regards to the special constitutional status of Islam as it has been the religion and custom of the Malays for over five centuries. I will be continuing the presentation with the implementation of the special constitutional status of Islam. So, the first thing that we will look at is item 1 of the state list in the ninth schedule. So, Sharia courts have the jurisdiction of a person who profess the religion of Islam except in regards to matters included in the federal list of the ninth schedule. So example that is provided in this uh, item 1 of the ninth schedule of the state list is um, betrothal, marriage, divorce, zakat, fitra, baitumal and in this item 1 also mentioned that Sharia courts have no jurisdiction in respect of offences except insofar as granted by the federal law. Uh, Charter courts have jurisdiction in respect of the control of propagating doctrines and beliefs among persons professing the religion of Islam and in respect of determination of matters of Islamic law and doctrine of Malay custom. So these are the example of statutes which we can see uh, Islamic law is implemented. So we have Sharia courts, uh, criminal jurisdiction, administration of Islamic law, Islamic family law, Sharia criminal offenses, Sharia criminal procedure, Sharia court evidence, Sharia court civil procedure. So from this list, we can see that Islamic law is widely implemented and it also applies only for those who profess the religion of Islam. So, in the case of Shamala Anak Perempuan Satya Silen and Dr. J. Aganesh Anak Lelaki Simora Moga Raja, the jurisdiction of the Sharia Court was questioned whether they can actually hear this case. So the High Court held that Article 121 Clause 1A of the Federal Constitution provides that the High Court and the subordinate courts which is provided in Article 121 Clause 1 shall have no jurisdiction in any matter in which the Sharia Courts have jurisdiction. And the High Court judge also refer to the judgment given by Harun Hashim CJ at SCJ in the case of Muhammad Habibullah bin Mahmud and Farida bin Tidatu Talib. So in this case, uh, Harun Hashim SCJ said that uh, in Article 121A1 Clause 1A, in Article 121 Clause 1A, 
it is obvious that the parliament has the intention to take away the jurisdiction of the high courts in respect of any matter within the jurisdiction of the Sharia court. Okay, so now we will move on to the current challenges that uh, threaten the special constitutional status of the Islam. So, uh, the first challenge that we found is whether this Article 3, Clause 1 is still significant. So, if we read Article 3, Clause 1 with Article 11, it kind of uh, contradicting each other because if Islam is the religion of the Federation, how significant it is when there is another provision that provides that everyone has the freedom to profess any religion. So how does this article will protect the special constitution status that is provided in Article 3, Clause 1? So, in the case of Lina Joy and Majlis Agama uh, Wilayah and Anadim, the court say that Article 11, Clause 1 is to be read to be read together with Article 3, Article 12, Clause 2, Article 74, Clause 2, and Article 160 in a harmonious construction. And we can also look at the case of Sukma Dharmawan Samistat Madja and Ketua Pengarah Penjara Malaysia and Anadim. So, in this case, if the person who professed the religion of Islam committed an act which is an offence both under the penal code and the Sharia criminal offence, so the courts will refer to the Article 121 Class 1, which the courts that mentioned in this article will have jurisdiction to try such an offence. We can also look at the case of Che Omar Che So and public against public prosecutor, which provides that. The term Islam or Islamic religion in Article 3 of the Federal Constitution in the context means only such, such an acts as relate to ritual and ceremonies. And Islamic law was rendered isolated in a narrow confinement of the law of marriage, divorce and inheritance only. And while Article 162 on the other hand purposely preserve the continuity of the secret law prior to the constitution unless such law is contrary to the constitution. So from this case, we can see that the Islamic law can only be implemented in only in personal matters. So now we will also look at the case of Mio Atikur Rahman, Isha and others, and Fatima Sihi and others. So according to Article 11 Clause 1 of the Federal Constitution, Every Muslim has the right to practice his religion and it is unconstitutional to restrict a Muslim from wearing a turban because doing so would violate Articles 3 and 11. So, according to Article 11, Clause 5 of the Constitution, which supersedes uh, Article 3 and Article 11, the warning that the Muslim cannot wear a turban has nothing to do with the general rule of peace, public health or morality. So. From this uh, discussion, we can conclude that uh, Islam status as the official religion of the Federation and its special constitution status would undoubtedly be called into question if there, if there are uh, limitations on the areas in which its law and practices could be applied. So, if Article 3 Clause 1 provided that uh, Islam is the religion of the Federation, but uh, there are imp uh, limitations imposed on Article 3, Clause 1. So it can uh, question the special constitutional status of Islam. So unless if there is any provision in the pers uh, federal constitution which explicitly express that Islam and its law should take President over the civil law, then we can confirm that um, special constitutional status of Islam as the religion of the Federation can be protected. So that's all for me. Now I'll pass the presentation to the next person.
Another challenge to the special constitutional position of Islam comes in the form of the doctrine of basic structure. The doctrine of basic structure was introduced by the Indian Supreme Court in the case of Kesavananda Bharati and the state of Kerala. According to this doctrine, the constitution has certain fundamental elements or in other words, basic features that are permanent and cannot be changed or destroyed through legislative amendments. These basic features of the constitution are left to the court to determine as they are not defined in the constitution. The judiciary has the power to abolish any amendment to the constitution made by the legislature if it alters the basic structure of the constitution. While the implementation of the doctrine of basic structure does not threaten the special constitutional position of Islam per se, it poses a threat towards the position of Article 1211A, which essentially restricts the civil courts from hearing matters under, under the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. As prior to the amendment, this interference frequently happened. In Malaysia, the doctrine of basic structure was first discussed in the case of Loko Echun and the government of Malaysia. It can be inferred that the learned judge in this case rejected the application of the doctrine as Raja Azlan Shah, as His Majesty was then, was of the view that when the constitution was drafted, the framers armed parliament with the power to amend the constitution as in his words, while the constitution must be as solid and permanent as we can make it, there is no permanence in it. The constitution must be able to adapt to change and thus, power of amendment is a means to it. The precedent set in Lo Kui Chun was reaffirmed by Tun Sufyan in the case of Pan Chin Ho against public prosecutor, where the learned judge pointed out the differences between the Malaysian constitution and the Indian constitution. He also expressed that it is not enough for us merely to say that parliament may amend the constitution in the way they think fit, provided they comply with all the conditions, precedent and subsequent regarding and form prescribed by the constitution itself. However, in recent cases such as the case of Semenya Jaya, the doctrine of basic structure was inducted by the federal court where it was unanimously, unanim unanimously ruled that the doctrine of basic structure of the constitution applies to our federal court and that the power of judicial review is part of the basic structure of the constitution. On the other hand, in the case of Maria Chin Abdullah, the position against the, position against the application of the doctrine of basic structure was restored to the earlier position taken by Lo Kui Chun. The most important case when it comes to the application of the doctrine of basic structure and how it challenges the special constitutional position of Islam is the case of Indra Gandhi. The federal court in this case had restored the decision given by the high court. Separation of power and judicial review are part of the basic structure of the federal constitution. However, due to the amendment made in 1988 by the parliament, the, the judicial power was removed from the judiciary. Justice Zainun Ali restored back the ju judicial power as she held that Article 1211A cannot prevent ordinary courts from reviewing the act of Islamic institutions to determine whether these in institutions have acted ultra virus their statutory power. This also includes the wrong treatment of a subject that falls within the jurisdiction of a Sharia court. From this judgment, it could be seen that, that the Sharia court's jurisdiction is decreasing as civil courts could interfere or hear cases that are supposed to be under Sharia court's jurisdiction by virtue of Article 1211A. Thus, it can be concluded that the doctrine of basic structure could be a challenge to the special constitutional status of Islam in regard to the vid validity of Article 1211A. If this doctrine is adopted, Article 1211A will lose its relevance. When the said provision loses its relevance, the public would question whether it is significant to express that Islam is the religion of the Federation as the decision of the Sharia, Sharia court could be changed at any time through judicial review by the civil courts. However, if the doctrine is not applied to the federal constitution, then parliament would have the freedom to amend the constitution to what they deem necessary as there is no provision explicitly expressed in the federal constitution that prohibits the amendment of certain provisions. Besides, the federal court in Indra Gandhi's case held that Article 1211A was not meant to prevent civil courts from reviewing this, the, the decision made by the Sharia court. From this analysis, it could be said that there are advantages and disadvantages of this doctrine if it's applicable in Malaysia. Specifically, for the special constitutional status of Islam, this doctrine, if applied in Malaysia, would threaten the special position of Islam as the religion of the Federation as the relevancy of the imposition of Article 3 Clause 1 could be in question. In conclusion, by virtue of Articles 3, 
11 clause 4, 12 clause 2, 74 clause 2, 1211A, and 3 clause 2, it is clear that the federal constitution confers a special status to Islam. These provisions not only expressly legitimize Islam as the religion of the federation, but also confer certain powers on the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary in protecting the status. Moreover, in analyzing Malaya's legal system prior to British rule and the drafting history of of the Reid Report, it is clear that Islam has always been an integral part of Malaysian society and way of living. Despite this, there are still challenges to the special constitutional status of Islam today. In addressing this, it is worth noting that the federal constitution is a living document and should be interpreted with less rigidity and more generosity than other acts. This means that, apply that in applying any constitutional provisions, reference must always be made to the constitution as a whole. It is submitted that given even its special constitutional status, Islam in particular shall always be a consideration in interpreting the constitution. So that is all from us. Thank you.